Today on Locked On Red Wings, can Grand Rapids upset the Milwaukee Admirals? Previewing the division finals with Andrew Rinaldi of the Calder Times. Your Locked On Red Wings, your daily podcast on the Detroit Red Wings. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We are your hosts, Brian Fisher and Scotty Bentley. I am formerly a producer for 97 Won the Ticket, where Scotty is the host of Lockdown Tigers, as well as a freelance journalist for the Detroit News. And today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Lockdown to get $100 and 150 bucks with any winning $5 bet. Again, that's 150 bucks with any winning $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. I'm really proud of myself. I had that almost memorized word for word because uh, I couldn't find it on the sheet. I just was going off the top of my head. That was great. Andrew, it's nice to see you again, buddy. Uh, we're going into another series preview here, this time against the first seeded Milwaukee Admirals. And so because Scotty and I are we know our Red Wings, but we're kind of Grand Rapids casuals. We wanted to bring the expert back on to preview, but we also wanted to look back at the Rockford Ice Hogs series and pick your brain about how that went. And we'll do that. Before then, I want to give you an opportunity to say hello. How you doing, man? Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's it's been great over here in uh, in in Griffin's Land. I mean, it's unfortunately that the scheduling there's been a bit of a layoff, so I'm kind of just twiddling my thumbs as we're waiting here for Wednesday night, but yeah, the, it's, it's, it's finally here. And uh, you know, the excitement's just, it's, it's, it's starting to get me again. I got the, I got the goosebumps just ready to roll. Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk. I want to ask you about that layoff when we get to the portion where we're previewing the series, but I want to begin with that look back. I was talking about with the Rockford series. Uh, it went just four games. The Grand Rapids Griffins were, were able to, uh, win it, what, three to one in the five game best of five series. I wanted to ask you what your main takeaways were from that series when the Griffins at times looked like the best team on the ice, but at other times I was like, this doesn't look like the Griffins team I had heard about all year long. What were your biggest takeaways, both positively and negatively from that series against the Ice Hawks? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the identity of this team has always been resiliency, you know, talking about the the from the hole that they climbed themselves out of it early in the season to, you know, the, game two against Rockford, uh, not going to lie, this team just got punched in the mouth. You know, the Ice Hogs really kind of bullied them physically, and they responded with a great effort in game three to win that one at home and overtime. And, you know, the rest is kind of history there. So there's been some hiccups in this series against the Ice Hogs. You know, I talk about that game two. Game three, they had it firmly in control, three to one up until, you know, four minutes left in the period. They give up two quick goals. And all of a sudden you're on your heels and it's tied 3 3 going into overtime when you had it the game clearly in your hands. So, you know, for this team to be able to, to take those hits and to turn around with some haymakers of their own is, is kind of been the theme, you know, we've seen, I don't even know how many third period comebacks from this squad all season long, and they just don't quit no matter what the momentum is, no matter what the tides feeling, you know, they, they have this resiliency to grab that momentum and the rip it away from the other team before it kind of starts to, to overflow them. So that's, I think, been, you know, the biggest point of this team in this series is kind of really showing that kind of heart that you see in this squad. And, you know, in in terms of, I guess, a a negative takeaway, I don't want to, you know, it's, you, you want to see kind of some of those, some of those miscues cleaned up a little bit, I think, um, you know, especially I think the the power play has really been hurting this team. Um, I mean, great five on five, but with the man advantage and and all the talent that you see up and down on this squad, you really seeing them go over with with the extra guy is not. It's it's something that's definitely got to hopefully has been addressed over this week long rest because uh, Milwaukee's going to be a squad. They're not going to 
they're not going to give you a lot on the penalty kill. And if you don't take advantage, it's, it's going to be really tough to, for them to find that upset. Well, and you know, going back to when we had you on for the preview of uh, the Rockford series, you had mentioned that one of the biggest points in the series was going to be how the Griffins, uh, I guess I'll say navigated the physicality on, on the other side. Right. And um, I, I, that is, very obviously going to be something that just in big, important, you know, playoff hockey games in general is going to be uptick. So that's probably something that people care about going forward as well. So just kind of from what you saw, I mean, obviously they came out on top, but how did they handle that specific part of that aspect specifically, I guess? Yeah, it. I think the it, it's hard to narrow down to like one move, but yeah. Uh, Josiah Didier, the captain and, you know, big anchor on that blue line missed the first two games, just, you know, healthy, healthy scratch. There's only so many guys on that blue line that they can put in there. Um, coach puts them in for game three and, you know, game two, I want to say they had three goals off of deflections on Kosa. Another one was a rebound and just I, Rockford was just swarming their net and getting Didier in there and it really kind of set the tone for this team to clear that net to and and to really battle um, physically this team. Didier had a couple of big hits and not just that, some shot blocks, key breakups in the defensive zone. And it really kind of, again, helped take that momentum away from Rockford. And once they had it, they never really let it go. So a big part of it, I think, was not retaliating in certain instances. I know Grand Rapids kind of got burned against Rockford during the regular season for some of that, you know, extracurricular stuff. They didn't engage so much during the playoffs, which is shows, you know, that restraint and discipline to not give Rockford any extra chances. And, yeah, just continuing to to battle, not getting rattled. And, and you know, it's, again, it's – really nails into that resiliency of this team. Yeah. And that brings me to, I want to talk about individual players too, because you know, you saw my tweet, I've seen your tweets about the top three stars from that series, but I want to hear your take on here on the podcast about who you thought stood out a lot. And I mean, there's one in my mind I want to talk about, but I have a feeling he's going to be, you're going to talk about him. So, so, in that Rockford series, who were your three most standout players or just anybody else you want to mention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to not bring up Jonathan Berggren considering all three of his goals were game winners in this series. Um, and it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it, it, and it's the manner in which he scored them, you know, uh, game one kind of driving wide to the net, you know, guy draped all over him and he still gets the puck through the goalie's legs for the winner there. Uh, game three, you know, beautiful pass to Carter Mazer. Puck bounces off the post and it's a foot race and he beats the guy there and gets it in. Um, and then game four, you look at the angle in which he's, he roofed that puck on Camesso. It, it was a puck shaped hole. Like there was really nowhere else that that thing could have gone for it to go in. And, and, you know, you, you can't teach clutch. This guy just comes up and he loves to play in these big moments and he loves to, to come through for the team for it. And it's it was a treat to watch him. And it's hard not to put him as number one when he's got the winner in all three. Absolutely. Um, Austin Zarnick was incredible on on the penalty kill. He he was a massive producer offensively fit right in there with, with Berggren and he was just that dependable veteran presence that you need down the middle, especially at this time of the year. I'm, I mentioned Didier as well. I'm going to give another, some more love to, to Marco Casper. You know, he's the guy who really got that train rolling in game three. It didn't, you know, put up uh, uh, the stats that you might see from, from Berggren, but Still, especially, you know, I was in the building for game three and just impressive on both ends of the ice, always in the middle of every scrum. And he just I've said it about this kid all year, but he just looks way more comfortable than a 19 year old should look. He's got a very mature game and 
you know, he doesn't, he doesn't panic when he's got the puck. He knows how to make the right plays. And that's the stuff that the coaching staff keeps giving him love and ice time for. I love how much of a shit starter he was in that first game too. That first game was really physical as before Grand Rapids really figured out how to respond to Rockford's physicality. And he did not 19 years old and not the biggest player on the ice. He did not shy away from getting into it. And I'm like, I kind of love that from this kid. Cause he's going to need to do it. Also, does anybody more exemplify the difference between the AHL level and the NHL level than Austin Zarnick? He mm-hmm. played 30 plus games with Detroit, granted fourth line role, sheltered role, sheltered minutes, but only had one point in that span. But with Grand Rapids, the dude is a tank. He's driving lines, he's big PK presence. Like, does anybody more exemplify the, how much harder the NHL level is than Austin Zarnick's? Uh, experience and his, the role he's played with Grand Rapids versus what he did with Detroit. I mean, that guy, I love him with Grand Rapids and I hope they keep him around just for the veteran presence and as a depth call up, but just, I'm like watching him like this is our, this version of Zarnik looks like he'd be an NHL all-star right now with how he's playing in this series. And there's a whole galaxy of guys like that who come down here at this level and they dominate and it just for what at one reason or the other just doesn't translate to the next level. But those are the kind of guys that you need in your organization to fill out the depth who can come in and play those fourth line roles. They can come down here in Grand Rapids and and be the offensive drivers or even, you know, run a penalty kill unit. So it's he's he's going to be crucial to this team going down the stretch here. Absolutely. Uh, We're going to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to continue looking back on Rockford before getting into our preview of the Milwaukee Admiral Divisional Final Series. Um, And so stay tuned to segment two of Lockdown Red Wings. Got to talk to you guys today about Policy Genius. They're the country's leading online insurance marketplace. They save you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today. Visit or with Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical expenses. Policy Genius helps you compare your options from top companies, and their team of licensed experts is on hand to help talk you through it. They can easily compare quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find you the lowest price. Your work life insurance policy may not offer you protection for your family's needs, or even worse, it may not come with you if you leave your job. So make sure you check out Policy Genius and they, as they give you unbiased advice from a licensed expert support team. Thousands of five star reviews on Google and Trustpilot from customers who found the best fit for their needs. Check life insurance off your list in no time with Policy Genius. Head to policygenius.com slash lockdown NHL or click the link in the description to get your life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash lockdown NHL. Segment two, Lockdown Red Wings podcast. We're joined by Andrew Rinaldi, uh, Griffin's beat writer for the Calder Times. And we're picking his brain about the Rockford Ice Hog series before getting into the Milwaukee Admiral Divisional Finals. Scotty, what do you got for Andrew here? Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I you had mentioned, you know, individual players, three of the, the players that stood out to you. I think uh, just in general, whether he's on that list or not, everyone wants COSA updates as often as we can throw them out there. So just talk about how you think he looked uh, in that series. He... Uh... Game two, I think, not through any fault of his, but was was decently kind of rough for him. But and when you talk about resiliency of this team, I don't think it gets any more resilient than Sebastian Kosa because he turned in uh, an incredible game three, even with those those kind of two goals that tied it up at the end of the third period there where I feel like Rockford just kind of jumped on some opportunities. They kind of surprised him a little bit. You could tell he was a little frustrated with himself on the second one, definitely frustrated with himself on the third one, but uh, you can't rattle the guy. Uh, He was talking with Rockford the whole night. He even got ran over by Brett Sini in in a play that I couldn't believe that Grand Rapids didn't come out with a power play on. But, you know, no matter what Rockford threw at him, no matter how, you know, they got in his face and and were barking at him from the bench, this, that, or the other thing, couldn't rattle the guy. 
And, you know, in game four clinching scenario on the road, they got an early one on him from Lucas Reichel. And then he shut the, he, you know, he shut the door. The team kind of rallied behind him, gave him some support. And, and that was it to go into a, a road environment and, you know, close the door on the series. It, it doesn't matter if it's the NHL or the AHL. It's one of the most difficult things to do in this sport. And he kind of made it look easy, you know, it just a couple shots from Lucas Reichel beat him, but other than that, you know, dialed in and, I, you know, he didn't have the best numbers because that game two again was pretty rough. But, um, you know, it's it, it when you actually look and kind of see how he progressed through this series, nothing but but praise for this kid and what he was able to to bring to this team and ultimately, you know, closing this one out in four games. Well, yeah, I mean, you take that game two away, his numbers look a lot more impressive. No goalie, no player in any sport is going to go out there. Even the generational talents have bad games. So I, I don't look at his 880 save percentage in four games and like hit panic button under any stretch. And we've known Sebastian Costa to be a slow starter too. So I, I'm not shaken by my faith in Costa in these playoffs yet. Uh, but that being said, Carter Mazur, uh, we haven't really talked about him I have loved everything that I've seen out of Carter Mazur these playoffs. You know, a lot of we talk about Jonathan Bergeron's success uh, being the guy who scored the game winner in every single game, right? Like that's incredible. But I feel like almost every one of those goals would not have happened without support from Zarnik or Mazur. Mazur's a point per game so far, four points in four games, one goal, three assists. Because they're assists, not goals, he's not going to show up on a lot of the high right, highlight reels, but. I feel like he's been doing a lot of the little things right that have le has led to the success to of his teammates like Jonathan Berggren. Yeah, he and I had a chat with coach earlier this week and he basically expressed the the same sentiment, you know, when you have you know a guy like Zarnik who can distribute, a guy like Berggren who we all know what he can do with the puck and then you just got a, an absolute dog going into the boards and, and digging those pucks out and feeding it to these guys so they can make the magic happen. I mean, that's that's kind of the, it's the exact bread and butter mix that you want on that top line kind of driving this offense. And he's been out there, you know, taking whatever the Rockford defenders can give them and just throwing it right back in their face. And it's it's been awesome, especially this time of the year. That's the type of player that you need out there. You know, his his line got the shift right after Rockford took the lead on the power play in game four. They, you know, I, they I don't even think the Rockford uh, crowd knew what was going on before Mazur put the puck in the net and they tied it right back up. And so he's coming up big in big moments, just kind of seems business as usual for this kid. But he's yeah, the absolute dog up there. Coach loves his his compete and. You know, you're seeing the results coming from it here in the Griffins. You know what? Let's just make it, uh, uh, you know, go all the way around the ice here. We've talked about goaltending. We talked about a lot of forwards. How'd the blue line look? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. After that, that shaky game too, I feel like they kind of really settled in and, you know, like I said, they were really helping coast out aside from that hiccup in game three for those two goals. You know, they, they did their job again. You can really tell that Simon Edvinson after this playoff run is not coming back here. Yeah. And Albert Johansson probably not as well, but that's to be decided at a later time. And, you know, those two have really led the way. Of course, I mentioned Didier earlier, but it's it, it's they've been very cool and calm in their own end, which has really been impressive because Rockford really brings the heat on the forecheck. And... It's it's been those two again, Johansson and Edvinson have really been leading the way, but I've really been impressed also with Auntie Tuomisto, who, you know, kind of at the beginning of the season kind of struggled to get into the lineup. But as the year's gone on, his plays just steadily been improving and he had a couple of really good plays, both, you know, with long stretch passes kind of going in transition looking really good in his own end. So, you know, the kids are, are definitely coming along on, on the back end. They've been, and they've been helping Kosa out. And if Kosa can see the puck, he's probably going to make the stop. Awesome. Uh, we're going to head to another quick break. When we return, we will preview the series against the Milwaukee Admirals. So stay tuned for that in segment three of Lockdown Red Wings. 
Got to talk to you guys today about FanDuel. It's winner take all time in the NBA and NHL, and FanDuel's giving you a shot to bring home a big win of your own. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 to spend on bets like spreads, money lines, player props, and more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make every playoff shot count. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Segment three, Locked On Red Wings podcast. We're joined by Andrew Naldi, the Grand Rapids Griffins beat writer for the Calder Times. Uh, and we're going to move on now to previewing the series against the Milwaukee Admirals. Now, this is a Milwaukee Admirals team that I think we can all unanimously say we did not want to see. Uh, the Texas Stars held a 2 nothing series lead over Milwaukee. They needed to win one more game. But unfortunately, Milwaukee did Milwaukee things, forged a comeback, and now 10 days later, after a long layoff, the Griffins are going to be facing the first seeded Milwaukee Admirals, which means they have home ice advantage, not the Griffins. What can you tell us, Andrew, us uninitiated folks, about the Milwaukee Admirals? What do we got to know? They have size up front for days. Um, and this has been consistent with Milwaukee for as long as I've been covering this beat that – they have big bodies up front, and I mean, if you think Rockford plays tough and physical, this team comes at you with even bigger size, even meaner attitudes, and it, it it's it's going to be a dog a, a dog fight for sure. And it all for the Admirals, it all starts up front with Zach Larue. This kid was a first round draft pick a couple of years ago. And he's just been an absolute menace, especially at home the last couple of games. I think he put up what eight points in three games. I'm not exactly sure on that, but scored five goals in those three home games. And, you know, in, in that deciding game five had two of them in the first five, uh, the first minute of the game. And that kind of set the tone. Milwaukee just kind of ran away with it. Now, Texas, for some reason, had put their third string goaltender in that in a deciding game. And, you know, that's kind of the rest is history there. But, you know, this is a team that's stacked with depth in, in every single position. I mean, when you can take the 11th overall draft pick in 2020 and one of the – maybe biggest goaltending prospects that we've seen in a while in Yaroslav Askarov and sit him on the bench and then go out and win three straight games. I think that says something about your kind of roster. So there's a reason that this team won 19 straight games during the, the regular season, setting all sorts of records and everything, but the Griffins were the ones that knocked them off and stopped that winning streak. So, you know, there's, uh, there's, some history there that knows that like, okay, you know, we know that we can come up in big moments against this team and we know how to beat them. Well, I mean, I think one of the biggest talking points from, you know, a fan's perspective on the outside is, is a name you brought up. There is Askarov and you had mentioned kind of the, uh, his, his usage lately, just like talk a little bit about, I guess, what to expect in that. Are we going to see him? Is he going to allow a single goal? Just like talk a little bit about <laughs> kind of what to uh, expect out of him. Obviously, like you said, he's, he's one of the biggest goalie prospects in the entire NHL. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it's one of the biggest storylines for sure for the, on the Admiral side of things, because, you know, he starts game one and two down in Texas. I mean, Milwaukee didn't have the best showing in there, but, you know, there was one play in particular where a Stars player is coming around his net and Askarov just kind of clotheslines him. So you can. Oh, it, yeah, it's, I remember yeah. seeing that. Yeah, yeah, that was that was viral, crazy. yeah. He didn't so, kind of clothesline him. He, like, went after the guy. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was wild. So you can argue that maybe his, his focus wasn't there. So that way, by the time the series turned the, back into Milwaukee, they went with Troy Grosnick, who is a veteran at this level. He's won all kinds of awards, all left and right, wherever he's gone. And, you know, this team had the confidence to be able to go to a vet like him. And, yeah, he, he shut the door on – Maverick Bork, the AHL's MVP, and really only given up one point to him, and that was in the third period of Game Five. So, it's I, I'm I don't know if he if 
head coach Carl Taylor is going to say, okay, we're going to give Askarov another chance here. He hasn't seen a home game yet. They're going to start in Milwaukee. This is more of a, a regular schedule here. We've seen some weird playoff schedules here in the AHL, but now we're doing two games in Milwaukee, two games in Grand Rapids, and then game five, if necessary, will be in Milwaukee. So maybe they maybe they put Askarov out to start the series, um, you know, get him in front of the home crowd, see if maybe some time on the bench is giving them time to like, okay, focus in on your game. Don't let this outside noise kind of rattle you. And if he falters again, they know they have Gr- Grossnick on the back burner. Or they might just say, hey, Grossnick's won three straight. Why would we, you know, let the hot hand sit? Let's keep him going. You might not see Askarov in this series, depending on I, – I don't know what, what – coach is going to do i thought askarov was going to be the dog that they rode in on and they'd just be all said and done like i couldn't imagine a scenario where kosa's sitting for hutchinson but you know this is this is the playoffs and uh who knows but if if askarov is in i would not expect what you saw from him in the texas series i'd expect him to be dialed in i'd expect him to have his mind clear, and I mean, he's—I've seen him make just incredible athletic save after save. So it's—it would continue to be that absolute dogfight that we expect this one to be. Well, I'm—I'm I'm gonna finally get to the question that we teased so much in segment one, but the layoff, right? Ten day mm-hmm. layoff for the Grand Rapids Griffins. Meanwhile, it's series to series for Milwaukee, no rest. I mean, what do you expect from? What do you do? You think that the layoff will, I guess, help or hinder the Griffins? going into this series. Cause that's a long time to one practice and improve on things which were giving you trouble in Rockford, but also, you know, there's something to be said about momentum and lost momentum after 10 days off. Like how much of an impact do you think that layoff's going to have coming into this series? I fully expect there to be some rust for the Griffins to start this one off. I, you know, I was talking with coach about it. And, you know, they want to he wants to keep up the intensity and the practices and everything, which is fine and great. And that's exactly what you need to be doing. But there's something to be said about, you know, practice speed and and in game speed and how just how things operate. And it's it's only going to be human nature for there to be an adjustment period for them to kind of get the wheels back turning. And, and it's I, I imagine game one is probably going to be pretty sloppy for the Griffins. And, not, and it's just a matter of. I mean, it's it, it's playoff hockey. You just got to find a way to – if you can win an ugly game in game one, if you're not playing your best, then who cares, you know? But I definitely expect some rust in that one. Whether it hopefully shouldn't carry into game two by that point, it's like, okay, you know, you had the one. Now let's kind of get back on the horse here. But it's – no matter how well you practice, it's just not it's just not the same as game speed. So it's it's unfortunate that you know the format and everything and how the schedules have worked out, but that's just it's the way it is. That's the nature of the AHL. It yeah. sure is. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Just straight up, if you had to pick one, which I know is kind of unfair, but I'm I admitted I was putting you in an unfair place, so you can't be mad. <laughs> Biggest, he's immune to being mad. Big, yeah, he's not allowed. <laughs> Biggest single factor in this series, right? Whether it's a, a player, whether it's a, I don't know, something X's and O's wise. Just what is going to be the single most important thing for the Griffins if they do want to pull off the upset in this one? Power play. Got to got to score in the man advantage. I mean, it's you were able to get away with it against Rockford. And I think that was because they were able to carry the majority of the play. Uh, they're able to hold the puck in Rockford zone for mo- majority of those games. And, you know, to their credit, they were able to to execute five on five. I don't think you're going to have that kind of space against Milwaukee. I don't think you're going to be able to control the puck like that against Milwaukee. So when you have those opportunities on the man advantage, you got to convert these, the, you know, the struggles at the end of the regular season and the first series and, you know, I get working out the issues and everything. It's time to start burying those opportunities. And, you know, the to their credit, the, games three and four, the, the power plays look better. They weren't great, but they look better and they feel like you're trending in the right direction. So it, it doesn't matter if it's pretty, even if you get those ugly goals in, they just got to start happening because – 
otherwise it's it I, I feel like Milwaukee will they will score on the power play so if you don't match them it's gonna it's they're gonna get ahead of you real quick and I, I this is gonna be a very difficult team to play uh coming back from behind it's just nature of it awesome well Andrew thank you so much for taking the time to join us as usual and as usual why don't you tell the people where they can find you and read your stuff Absolutely. I, uh, you know, I'm going to be writing content for however long this playoff run goes over at the Calder times. And, you know, I'm, I'm very active on Twitter during the games. I I'm still going to keep calling it Twitter. Um, you have my, uh, my little at down there. There it is. Um, that's, uh, G R underscore Rinaldi underscore. I live tweet during the games. I, you know, I, share videos i love talking with fans about you know the players and just every everything about hockey i i'm i'm just i'm i'm a nut whether it's at this level or the next level or i'm watching you know my cousin's youth hockey team it's it's all great for me so um yeah if so if anyone wants to you know drop a line i'm i'm always willing and eager and yeah like i said i'm gonna be keep doing this until the final buzzer rings on this playoff run Absolutely. We're going to send you out to one of Brian's beer league games and you're going to give us an in-depth report on, on Brian Fisher, the enforcer and defenseman. I, I'm more than happy to, as long as you provide the, the six pack, my choice, I'll <laughs> happily come on down for that. You know, I, I got a game. We're recording this before my game on Tuesday nights. Andrew, if you, you can make it out there tonight, go. we'll talk there off you here. Give you the deep. scouting report. There you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll find oh, out if yeah. I earned that elite prospects page. Yeah, uh, right. Retired <laughs> for a reason retired. right there, bud. All right. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much. Scotty, you got a, you got a tagline you got to say? We've all, Andrew, we've all. appreciate it as always. Thanks we'll for having back. me again, boys. Of course. We'll be back with a new episode tomorrow. It's going to be a fun conversation, just kind of lighthearted stuff before we get to a draft profile with Tony Ferrari on Friday. So stay tuned to that. Same time, same place, to your team every day. Every day.